Good morning, good afternoon and good evening and welcome to our webinar today thinking about the automated contracting process three ways to get your contract management workflow right. So as I say welcome to our webinar today um, colleagues are still joining so uh, there will be a short delay as, uh, as more folks pile in. Uh, but certainly, if this is the, uh, the webinar that you plan to listen to, then you're most certainly in the right spot. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Paul Branch, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer here at World Commerce and Contracting, and I'll be your host for today. Um, I'm joined by a friend and colleague, Matt Gould, and, and Matt is the Head of Transformation and is also a GC at Contract Pod AI and is our partner for our session today. Uh, Matt and I are both practitioners in this space um, and workflows and particularly the automation thereof, hugely, hugely important. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, we do have an e exciting action packed set of uh, slides to share with you and also then a demonstration at the end. So uh, stick around, this is gonna be, this is gonna be good stuff. Okay, so um, housekeeping though, um, you have joined uh, with your lines muted. That's not because we don't want to hear from you. We, we most certainly do. Uh, but we also need to maintain the audio quality of the recording that we're making. So please ask us questions. Ask us questions that we, we can answer in the moment and we will, we will address those as we go. But also there'll be a Q&A slot at the end for you to ask us questions that are maybe a bit more meaty that we can then ad address and discuss together. Also, feel free to use the chat feature. Um, both of those, the Q&A and the chat feature, are both available at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and then last but not least, yes, you will most definitely get a link to this recording so you can review the material if there's something that you might have missed. And also you get a copy of these slides as well. Um, and we'll share that out in a link, in an email link after the, uh, the session. So, Without further ado then, let's crack on. What I'm gonna do first, Matt's gonna, gonna share with us his, um, his experience and his expertise in workflow design. And so that's gonna be the meaty part of it. But what I'd like to do before we do that is share with you the, the, the keys really. Why is focusing on workflow such an important part of the role of a commercial and contract management practitioner? start looking at the stats. Based on re research that we've done quite recently and we've just, re just released actually in World Commerce and Contracting, we've identified that there are 40, 40 typical, what we call friction points within the life cycle of a, of a contract, within the contract life cycle itself, 40. Now, not all of these are disruptive, but certainly a large proportion of those that occur post-award are absolutely dilutive of the value associated with the contract. So we need to try and minimize the impact of those friction points, if not eliminate them altogether. So 40, pretty chunky number, it gets worse. Only 11% of organizations that we polled consider their end-to-end -end contracting processes to currently be very effective. On a sliding scale, most were very much down towards the bottom end of that scale. And there's some research that Contract Pod AI themselves have done. 83% of companies do not use automation for standard contracts, let alone those contracts that have a high degree of uncertainty in delivery or deliverable. So what an opportunity it, 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 it presents to us. Only 11% of organizations consider their end-to-end -end contracting process to be very effective. 11%. That is pretty shocking, isn't it? So um, what are the benefits? If we were to focus some of our energy onto the end-to-end -end CLM process itself, and then the workflows associated with each of those steps, and then look to apply typically after process re-engineering to look to apply automation, what sort of business benefits are we likely to see from that? 
Well, most definitely we're going to save cost and associated with that, we're going to save time. But also um, we'll see in just a second that by adopting consistent workflows, we can both improve accuracy, consistency, we can improve task management and eradicate human error. Let's look at those step by step though. Save cost. If you've tuned into World CC presentations before, this statistic will not be new to you. Nine on average, 9.2% of uh, revenue leaks as a consequence of ineffective commercial and contract management every year. 9.2%, and that's an average. Some industries where there's perhaps capital uh, intensive um, engagements, longer term projects, higher risk, more complex contracting frameworks, that can approach 16 to 18%. So if you were to go to your CFO with a plan to eradicate, say even half of that dropping down to the bottom line to create that value addition, you would be uh, considered <clears throat> a hero once you deliver those sorts of benefits. I, I, see, I see Matt laughing. Save time, Opp opportunity number two. 82.5% of the respondents to a survey see increase in speed and efficiency as the number one driver for digitization. This is under underpinning why we, we're going through a digitization activity. So um, those two combine to, to illustrate, I think, the size, the magnitude of the prize that we have. So let's move on though to, to look at, looking at some of the other benefits. We have um, an opportunity here to improve um, uh, the accuracy and consistency. This is an interesting stat from Gartner. By 2023, artificial intelligence will bring 30% more efficiency to contract negotiations and completion. Now, certainly World CC research in this space, I wouldn't say contradicts, but certainly refines that thinking in that it depends hugely on the degree of complexity within the contract. For example, if you have a simple transaction-based contract with little um, uncertainty in deliverable, and little uncertainty in delivery, then the application of technology, not necessarily even artificial intelligence, but the application of technology to drive out human engagement can drive huge benefits, significantly more than 30% increase in efficiency. Um, so certainly though, as we, we, we've also found that as you move into uh, contracting frameworks that have greater uh, uncertainty in deliverable and or delivery, and where a relational sort of engagement would, would, would work better, that's an example of where, yes, the application of technology, natural language, machine learning, and other branches of artificial intelligence can deliver material improvements. Okay, let's look at, let's look at the, uh, the human error item. This is from the DocuSign research. 94% of people say that human error impacts the contracting process. Um, I'm surprised actually it's not 100%, but you know, there or thereabouts. And then last but not least, this interesting stat from the Harvard Business Review. Managers spend 54% of their time, so over half of their time in administrative coordination and control tasks that arguably could be materially improved, made significantly more efficient as a consequence of implementing new and, uh, and, and, and effective workflow. So, so Matt, before we move on, any, any, any thoughts on, on the, the benefits that we've looked at so far? Yeah, but, and, I, and I think uh, um, it's really fascinating looking at the stats here because I, 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 you know, as a manager myself, having led legal teams, I, it was actually seeing, seeing it black and white that 54% uh, time spent on admin coordination control tasks, and it's so true. Um, we're all time poor, whether that be um, legal counsel, whether that be GC, whether that be whoever that be in, 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 the, um, in the business. And actually the amount of time that is wasted 
in an organization because of inefficiencies. Um, and, and I think that that is one of the key things that when you realize that these tools do exist um, and there are easy, and I, I think what 80, the previous stat, what 83%, I think, um, see increase in speed efficiency top drive of the organization, which actually does give you that indication that people are not using things that are available out there. Um, and, and I think that really part of what we're talking about today is to just demonstrate that actually, if you think about it, it is relatively straightforward. It is quite easy in effect to actually put, the tools do exist out there in order to automate these functions. Um, and actually uh, it always amazes me that more businesses are not using them or not using them as well as they can because of the, of the, 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 the human benefits, if you like, just in addition to the, to the, to the business benefits. And I think hopefully we'll talk about that um, uh, going forward. And also it's my observation, I don't know if you, you agree, but the, the, the return is non-linear. You know, you only have to make small little baby steps of improvement to see actually quite dramatic shifts. Oh. In I think you're totally right because implementing one of these tools or a new workflow engine can be something you can do within a matter of certainly two or three months, sometimes even shorter than that. So it's, so it's not these aren't necessarily, yes, you can do the big complex global transformations, which can, which, which of course can take a, a long time, a lot of effort, but you can actually get quite a lot of um, value in a very short period of time by, by running a project. Um, and, and it'd be amazing. Uh, and the, the benefits that people can get on the ground from doing that, I think uh, just, uh, uh, it's something that, but you need to think about it properly, do it properly to get the benefits. And we've all been involved with um, various implementations of, of various systems over the years that, that haven't necessarily, that, that, that haven't necessarily gone as well as they might. And this is about as long as they're thought through up front that you actually think we're, we're going to yeah. share with our audience a way uh, that, that we would recommend for how to approach that workflow re-engineering and redesign excellent so that's that's our starting pitch that's why we're here that's why we think that automate automating workflow is such an incredibly important part of the role of the con commercial and contract manager but but where can you do it our research has shown based on that friction point research that, that we have we have these um, friction points throughout the entire process. There are opportunities, therefore, we believe, to automate elements within each of the steps of the process. So, for example, pre-execution, before you've executed the agreement, there are opportunities to, to improve the request management component using streamlining contract requests to a legal team using a process using an authorization and, and, and approvals activities. In the generation, you can apply technology and an efficient workflow to automate contract generation, either in, in through the application of templates or as we would advocate through a more um, industry standard clause library uh, and, and fallback generation sort of capability based on a risk profile. Negotiation, automated workflows to assist with the approvals processes. Some corporations have very complex approvals requirements driven by business need. It's not just be there because they're, you know, they, 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 they wanted to make it complicated. Um, so, but uh, ap applying a, a workflow to automate those, that approvals process, particularly one that has multiple levels driven by perhaps the risk of the agreement or the value or, or, or some other parameter is actually really material, can deliver material benefits. Moving then, swinging into post-execution, we find that about half the, the, the value erosion occurs post and half the value erosion occurs pre. So a large chunk in post, but let's face it, this is an area where generally we, we tend to, 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 to um, not focus our energy. Um, my, my, my experience and my, my engagement in practice has really been 30 odd years in post award management. This is where you can drive huge improvements in value, particularly in that manage phase where you're using um, effective workflow to do your obligations tracking, your jeopardy management, your risk and issues management, automatic change control. You're looking for you know, managing the, the timetable, automatic renewals, terminations, those sorts of things. Analytics now, particularly with the application of artificial intelligence, enables us to do much more across a portfolio of contracts, pulling out metadata, managing the contracts in a much more efficient way through an effective workflow. Last step, e-signature. This applies both pre and post, I think. 
but th this huge opportunity to use electronic signature in the in life management of contracts, execution of change controls, delivery of of uh, contractual materials, milestone completion certificates, local services agreements, all these sorts of things, all the minutiae of managing a contract in life can be done much more efficiently using e-signature. Okay, so that gives you a flavor for the sort of areas of, implement of, of, of automation that can be deployed across this process. But our question for our audience is how far have you got? How many of those of the contract process steps that I've just shared, those six process steps, um, how many have you successfully automated? Are you at the starting end? So you're, you're, you're on the beginning of this journey, so you haven't really got automation in any of the steps yet? Or are you at the other end of the spectrum where you've got automation, sizable chunks of automation that's clearly delivering business benefit in, those, in each of those six areas, both pre-award, and post award. So let us know. Um, and uh, we're going to be closing the polls in just one, uh, one or two more seconds. So please do do share. Um, and Carla can make let, let's take a look at the results. Right, really interesting, really interesting. 31% um, of the folks that, that, that shared um, have not deployed automation. Um, you're at the right place, guys. Welcome. This uh, webinar is going to be really, really important for you. We're going to share, I think, some where the pitfalls are, some of the things that we've done that we would never do again. And indeed, let's be more positive, the, the things that we have done that proved to be successful in our, in our practices that we would encourage you to adopt. What a great opportunity, though, in that one to two. You know, you've made a start. You're on that process. You're on that, you're on that uh, path. Good stuff. Excellent. More to do, though. This is not. Uh, this is not a one and done. This process re-engineering is a, is a is a cycle, and as you'll see, um, you know, our recommendation is to do it in, in discrete little chunks. Interesting. Twelve percent of the population have got automation in, in five or six of these key areas. Fantastic. That um, is going to improve your competitive advantage. I would argue already has, but it is going to set you up for a successful path to continued profitability. Matt, any surprises in this in these stats? Um, I, I was just delighted to see that uh, that there is a portion of our, uh, of our of our audience that actually have really gone through the whole automation process, um, and and so which I think just proves that this can be done. And I think hopefully the, the, those people who've been involved and whose companies have uh, gone down gone down this route really can see the benefits. Um, but then it, it, it also, when you look at actually that a third of our participants haven't even started on the journey. And I think that th this is where, and, and, and I think that that really, it actually it, it surprises me that that is actually that high. Maybe that's why people have uh, decided to join uh, to join the seminar uh, because actually they 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 clearly are interested and want to um, move this on. But um, uh, I I, it, I think it just shows that there and hopefully we'll, again we'll we'll show that that it is something that people can do and and the benefits really are out there. Yeah, absolutely, totally, totally. Yeah, this is not a negative picture. I think a huge opportunity out there for doing what we're about to to share doing it well, reliably to drive efficiencies. Okay, Matt, so, <clears throat> so let's look at um, the, 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 the second piece of this, what part of the process can be automated. Um, I think based on, based on the work that, we, that we've seen, um, the, 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 this research, it was from Gartner a while back, um, suggests that there are material improvements that can be made in the various process steps in drafting, negotiation, review, and, uh, and, in, and in this area of corporate transactions. Um, that resonates with me. I'm, I'm, I don't know about you, Matt, what do you think? Yep. Uh, I, I, absolutely, and I, and I think that um, again, it's it's looking at all of those, all of the areas where because where where things can be more efficient and that they can be done easily, which is in all these cases, say it's just over half, because of the point we're not in any way removing the fact that a lot of contracts are very complex, a lot of 
deals are, 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 are tricky, and so therefore, in the draft and negotiation, the things that that, that uh, no people will not uh, be be replaced by AI anytime soon. Um, in, but it doesn't mean that we can't be more efficient uh, and uh, and and hand over hand over to the machine those things that um, uh, that that are repetitive. Absolutely, yeah, Matt. I'm going to hand over to you in just one hot sec to take us through the the the, the meat of this about how to do the work. Um, but before before I do that, though, guys. If you do have questions, please do start using that Q&A tab to raise questions of, of the panel that you have. Now's a great time to, uh, to start cracking, those, cracking through those questions. OK, Matt, back to you. The three steps to building great workflows. Thank you, Paul. Um, and I think it, 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 like, like, like anything, it's about what is it that you need to do? So start by, so we're going to talk about the three separate sections here, the examining and benchmarking where, where we are currently. Creating a brain trust, what we mean by that is actually who it is that we need to take inputs from in terms of how to um, uh, make sure that we're doing this and we're, and we're engaging all parts of an organization. Um, and then finally, the blueprint that we would then want to develop in order to make sure that we are um, going to be moving in the right direction. We have a plan that we can achieve. So um, the, the, the first thing, of course, is to actually look at what is your current process um, and uh, and I think it, it amazed me, and probably the the the, the third of, uh, of 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 companies that haven't necessarily even started. This is really where where you start, just trying to think about what is the current process that you use in your organisation. What is the difference? Uh, who who? What is the what? What stages you need to go through to actually get to an approval to to get a contract signed? Who actually has the signature? Um, uh, what are what are the company's policies and guidance? Have they been as well articulated as they as they might have been? And which different departments uh, who's requesting contracts and how? For example, sales teams may be requesting contracts, uh, procurement team, property team. So where 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 are those different elements coming from in the in the business? Um, and then of course, what are the current bottlenecks? Because it's like I'm sure in any in any organization that I've worked in, there are certain parts, certain individuals are very quick at giving approvals. They're very happy to take a brief, read a document, give you a very quick response. Other individuals uh, may not be. And is that because of it's an individual that's creating a bottleneck? Or indeed, is it actually the process? Is it the fact that you don't have too many options within that process? And, and actually then examining that those once you can get to the bottom of those root causes, then you can actually start to identify what is your correct process. Um, looking at this in terms of contract value, for example, different contracts require different levels of sign off. Is it your own paper? Is it third party paper? Is it in a, uh, a low risk jurisdiction? For example, maybe the UK, Europe, is it in a high risk ju jurisdiction? Um, and therefore looking at the level of risk and making sure which actually toes goes back to your company policies and guidelines in terms of thinking about all of those issues in terms of whether or not um, you're actually putting the correct approvals are the right people involved. And it, the reason you actually have to start by whiteboarding all of this is to really work out actually, e even to the extent, is the organization working as efficiently as it should be, even before you start automating? Um, I mean, we, we've seen examples when we've been working with clients um, where, where, for example, we were looking at some, a relatively low risk country um they, they, they were multi uh, multinational with um, uh, different parts of the organization different countries but with a, a very regional sign-off process and some of the simple jurisdictions in fact had far more complex sign-off processes internally than, uh, than than some of the more high risk jurisdictions and when you start to get the team of people together and, and start to analyze this you go that doesn't make a huge amount of sense okay. what what we then started, what the team, when they started to go and look, think a bit about corporate history, was that actually four or five years earlier, there'd been an acquisition, a merger of two, merger of, merger of two organizations, and the workflows were sort of legacy from the two different organizations. And whilst they tried to simplify their policies, one part of the business had had a more complex uh, approvals process internally, um, historically, and, and that had sort of somehow never, no one had ever got rid of it. Um, and, and yet, so therefore you were making relatively standard form contracts, low risk contracts, needing to have far higher approvals than in fact, the, as it turned out, that the, the corporation as a whole was actually comfortable with. 
Um, and so this is why you actually have to look at the organization as a whole and work out what is sensible, what are the levels of risk, and usually companies have worked all this kind of things out already, but actually maybe try and simplify that by the contract types, contract value, get everything in a list so that you can work out what it is that you're trying to automate. So, so Matt, we have the great question here from Jason, spot on here. What if the necessary metrics and benchmarks don't exist when trying to build the business case? E.g. you don't know your current cycle time for some categories of contract. Are these deployments more effective when companies actually take a step back and do the research to compute the metrics up front? Or what other strategies um, are successful in the absence of these metrics? Asks Jason. Uh, uh, Jason, that is a fantastic question. And I think it actually leads very much onto the next slide, almost as if you knew the flow. Um, but um, uh, but I think that one, one, one of the um, things I think it, it is, but taking a sort of slight step back, but to, to I think it, it is a case of thinking those matters through and actually whiteboarding it um, in order to actually work out what are the metrics. It may well be that, that there's an instinctive feel as to what those metrics might be. For, as, I, as I mentioned there in that example, it's about finding what are the anomalies where, for example, for historical reasons, certain types of contracts have, for example, a lower financial threshold for needing um, uh, finance, finance approval, for example, than other types of contracts. But actually, but identifying what those are in order that at least you can ask those questions of the of the very senior management about what where are they comfortable with that risk sitting and trying to actually look at it in a slightly holistic rather than maybe many organizations develop workflows over years in a siloed kind of manner, whether that be ge geography or department based. But the more holistic you can look at that, um, and and then start to think about when you're talking to the people who are using the contracts, who generally have a bit of a feel in practice as to what the different levels of risk are, because the legal team always has a pretty good knowledge. The procurement team may well, the finance team. So at that sort of practical level, where are those anomalies sitting? Um, and then actually, what is it you can... So I think that, I suppose what I would say is that really you can start setting the benchmarks at an intuitive level in order to start the process. And that's how I would do it. You start with those anomalies, start asking the questions, but then you can then start looking about how do you want to benchmark in the future? So for example, look at number of contracts self-generated by business users. Are you actually being as efficient as possible? Maybe you need some more templates, for example. Maybe actually there are some relatively standard contracts that are being used very regularly, at which point by automating those, by getting a pretty standard, easy, workflow, you can get NDAs, you can get standard form agreements, lease agreements, for example, um, generated without needing any kind of almost uh, human intervention. But then actually, where have you got the stages, the days between the contract stages? Where is that briefcase time? Who is it that's slowing things down? Um, look at those. And how long is actually your data final con contract execution? I, but again, what I would say in many cases is that people don't actually know because if you're working in a non-automated environment, you probably don't know the answers to some of these questions. But what you do know is that your sales director is saying it's too long. Your finance director is saying we've missed a deadline. How did how come I missed the opportunity to renew a contract? And I'm now having to scrabble around. So there'll be a lot of anecdotal evidence that things aren't going according to plan. And then at the very least, you can then start setting these and setting these as benchmarks going forward. Um, and again, there might be external uh, stakeholders, third parties, for example. And, and then I think that, the, that it's always worth thinking about which agreements are, are standard, but which ones really do have a compliance element, whether that be GDPR, whether that be higher risk contracts, um, and trying to analyze which contracts are in which, in which bucket, because then what, what are you going to automate? Where, where do you want the approval workflows to sit in order that you've actually got that kind of matrix going? Mm, great, great response, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for the question. Thank you. A great question. Um, I, I mean, I just 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 an example though. I mean, the the, the Concord Technology Group um, uh, example. We 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 know. I mean, they they 
that they actually managed to, uh, to, to, to improve. Um, uh, they were getting payments 60 days late um, and they managed to get payments 90 days ahead of renewals because actually by building those, by building that in, you can also, um, you can actually start really impact, impact your cash flow because if, are you getting your invoices out at the right time? Is the methodology going out in order that the finance system is issuing those invoices um, ahead or is it behind the curve? Um, and sometimes um, you, the, 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 those kinds of improvements really can be can be driven by by having those, uh, as Paul was saying earlier, having those uh, those those obligation management within the within the process. Just um, and, and and actually just want to um, talk about so and this is the kind of thing just to give you a snapshot. This is the kind of tool. Once you actually start to automate um, a workflow, you can actually then give yourself very very easy dashboards to see where things are. So going back to Jason's comment earlier in terms of setting your benchmarks. At the very least, you can set the topics about the things that you want to record, and then you can then start putting real time data, which then gives you the opportunity to look at, for example, uh, in, the, in this particular sort of um, demonstration slide here, sort of where are your legacy requests coming from, where are your author requests, who's, and from these kinds of um, analytics, you can then see who it is that's generating the contracts, which contracts are uh, are, are being generated uh, more, more regularly than others, and also how long the contracts are taking within the cycle, which then means you can then start looking at where you've actually got pain points, pinch points within your system, where your approvals may be slowing down, where there may be an issue with a briefcase time, because you're actually very easily now able to go back to the business and go, this is, this is where there is a problem, or indeed we've got a pile of these contracts coming in from around the world, we really ought to automate this particular template because actually it, it's still being done in a, in a non-automated way, therefore it's taking longer and it's an obvious candidate for, for, um, for template automation. Um, and again, then you can really start setting the benchmarks for continuous improvement within the organisation and you're no longer working off anecdotal evidence, you're actually working off real data. The, uh, and I think this probably links to, 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 to what I was saying earlier. Uh, the, the, the first thing to do is to actually, it, this isn't something that the legal team can or the contracting team can do by themselves. So the first thing is to actually sort of create a project team uh, as, as, as so many things are. Um, these are, the, these are the, 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 the core groups that I would suggest would need to be involved in, uh, in, in collaborating as a sort of project team to discuss uh, probably the legal contract ops, clearly sales team, operations, supply chain, procurement, finance, accounting, and IT. Um, and then the, the, the questions that, that, that can then be discussed is actually what is their priority when it comes to the contract? How much additional work does a contract create for the team? What bath bottlenecks do they have? And also what is the negative impact on the contract being delayed? And the answers to those key questions are going to be different for the different teams. And, and I think one of the things, I'm mean, still a bit of Paul's thunder for later, but one of the, the key things here is not to try and boil the ocean. Um, because if you actually if you actually look at everything you could possibly do for your organization, you will never start. Um, and I think that one of the um, things that I find when talking to GCs is that there is a desire to improve. There is a fear that this is going to be so big, so complicated. But actually, then it's about working out where are the priorities within the organization. Is it book to bill cycles, for example? Is it is it um, uh, is it cash collection? Where is it in the organization that there is that there is a driver from a business perspective, um, and therefore who needs to be involved in that? And it may be that uh, that that you know an entirely manual process from the legal team with people running around with bits of paper as I used to do when I was a bit more junior lawyer than I am now um, and genuinely running around and asking people to sign pieces of paper is, is, is perfectly fine for the organization it may not be fine for the individual but it may be fine but actually the reality is which cases do you need kind of that kind of very uh, very hands-on very detailed uh, thought process that money, multiple people involved in, in decision making and when actually is it actually a relatively straightforward? Um, and so I think uh, asking those questions, getting that team together um, is the uh, is, is a very key. You know, you know, Matt, we've seen a lot of this within World CC. You know, one of our one of our uh, consistent observations, at least, is around stakeholder engagement. And this is just yet another example. Uh, an, an extension, if I might, though, is Please. that that middle circle around the supply chain. 
with 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 um, you know in the automotive industry, for example, eighty percent of the eighty percent of the value comes from in source components. So therefore, engaging with your stakeholders external to the enterprise in your primary, secondary, and tertiary supply chain um, is hugely important. You know to understand so that to to incorporate um you know obviously you're not going to be work work designing workflows um in detail in those in those external organizations but certainly focusing on the interface points where data information deliverables milestones activity uh, research you know communications happen making sure that that's orchestrated within your workflow is really, really important as and, and a, an a integral element of this stakeholder engagement. And it's one that we, we don't do very well. Is, is coming from. Paul, and I would entirely agree because if you think, going back to where one of the, the comments we mentioned earlier in terms of who is it that is requesting a contract, who is it that's generating the, the desire, the need for a contract in the first place? Is mm. it the sales teams because actually it's part of their sales process? Um, and so, so therefore, is it is about so therefore they need to be involved in how is it do they generate that contract in a very simple way? What is the templates? What's the documentation that that, that, that they need? What is the approval process? And clearly, the business needs to make that uh, any business wants to make that as simple as possible. But we also know that contracts can be complicated. But 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 what is but but when you when you can put the, the conditional logic and all these more complicated things into a workflow in terms of who has a certain sign off if certain clauses are changed if certain jurisdictions are there, but all of which can be thought through and can be built into a workflow in terms of who needs to sign off what it is all actually automatable so it's again it's a project of work but ultimately for the business it actually can be hugely beneficial not only for the uh the the, the lawyers the contract managers but also for the for the actual business users themselves the sales guys and ultimately as you were saying the um, as we touched on earlier the, the the sort of senior management who have to get involved in things because one of the things that i've always again what as a learning I had as a relatively junior lawyer, just because a contract of a certain size with a, of a certain value in a certain geography required a very high level of approval. Reality is simply going to that individual and saying, hey, can you read this 300 page contract and then sign it, please, Mr. Managing Director, really is not the way forward. Um, of course, what actually what the Managing Director is going to sign the contract was, and hopefully in an automated manner, is simply to know that everybody else who is involved in the approval process has given their approvals. And again, uh, we're not going to touch in great detail here, but but, but of course, in a, a really good approval process, all of those internal approvals are captured in the system so that you know that the finance director has signed off. The IT director has signed off if it's if it's got certain types of clauses in. If there's a GDPR clause, maybe the IT security director has has uh, has given their sign off to their parts of the contract, which point it's not just about a workflow. It's also about recording those individual sign offs so that by the time it gets to the, uh, the managing director and he then gets it, he knows that everybody else has signed it off and therefore he's signing what is a very clean contract, even though it may be a very high value contract and he's got that certainty and therefore the business moves in a very um, slick fashion. And that, that piece on audit is really, really important. And it's not, not just the approval, but if there's a derogation against standard business practice or, or an extension has been made or some, some out of the ordinary thing has been processed, maintaining that with an explanation as to why that, that decision was made what risks were balanced uh, to, to make that decision um, is a really powerful piece of knowledge that, that the corporation is, is, uh, is maintaining there in that approval system. No, and, and, you know, and, and, and again, in the, these days in, in very regional uh, multinational organizations, it may well be that the director of a subsidiary in a certain country may be the required for, for um, local legal reasons, may be the person that has to sign the contract. They may not be the person in the organization organizational hierarchy that needs to actually give final approval um and and particularly for example if people are using a, a certain kinds of um, offshore jurisdictions or whatever where the signatory may not be uh, maybe slightly outside the business being able to have that everything tracked 
um, and stored within a process system gives everybody that certainty that the right steps have been followed. Um, and generally organizations have this, but going back to where I started, um, it's actually about making sure that you've got this in a logical, straight down, uh, sort of an organized way. And one of the things that we're going to talk about, um, uh, Tara, who's, uh, who's on, on the, on the um, call and is going to do a little, uh, little demo um, in um, actually a couple of minutes, um, need, to, need to speed on, um, is to actually, to actually give a, uh, to, a little bit about how you might go about building one of these in a, in a very practical environment. Which probably does mean that I should move quickly, um, because uh, to to the the final stage here, which is the blueprint. Um, and I say once you've done all those, once you've done the fact finding, as we've talked about, once we've actually then um, engaged with all the stakeholders, then actually then how do we transition from the current state to the desired state? And of course, that is about developing a blueprint. Um, and it comes back again, go back to Jason's point in terms of what are the the, the benchmarks? Um, what is the account? How are we actually going to to achieve it? What are the benchmarks that we're going to go through so that you can actually sort of see just like in any project plan, what are we actually going to do? What is success? What is failure? In order to actually go through the automation process. Um, and then uh, just, I think, on a very final piece, really, is actually looking at that how, what does the future look like? What are the benchmarks? What are the goals? Obviously, who has been involved from a request point of view? Who has to give the approvals, signatures, external parties? These are very, very simple pieces of information that actually come out of that, uh, that the, 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 the workshops. And then what do you actually then need to achieve that? Contract templates, clause library, for example, which contracts do need could be turned into a template? What are your alternative clauses and provisions? What are the approval steps? The conditional logic, as we sort of just touched on, which is a is a, is a seminar all in itself, um, the people that have to be engaged. And then, and only at that point, really, do you start to talk about what are the tools that you can actually use to, um, uh, to, 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 um, uh, to, to actually achieve that. And so that, that, but if you get all that in a very organized way, then, then really you can move this along very rapidly. Paul. A really consistent set, I think. Uh, those those three logical steps really neatly fit together. But let's go back out to our audience and uh, let's let's hear from you guys. What is your biggest challenge when it comes to building great workflows? Unclear process? Is it the issues that we talked about with Jason around stakeholder involvement? Is it you're not really sure where to start? Is it the temptation to as, as Matt shared, to boil the ocean, to try and do everything at once? Or, or, or is it something else? Now, uh, if you click the other, uh, we do ask that you that you share with us in chat what the other thing was um, so that we can uh, we can get a better idea. Um, but um, Carla, let's let's bring the poll to a close. Let's um, let's take a quick look at the results. Interesting. Nearly half say stakeholder engagement, stakeholder involvement, is a, is, a, is a big challenge. Adopt the technique that, that Matt shared, identifying your, your range of stakeholders and ensure early engagement. That's a, that's a really, um, that's a, unclear processes. Uh, the next step really is, is, to, is to gain that clarity and the way to do that is to, is to begin documenting them and reviewing them in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a group in that user group of stakeholders and then boiling the ocean this is really an issue with with when you go to develop workflow and it's one that i fell into when 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 i was starting out and um, the temptation is to try and do everything at once don't jason's got another good question about how to how to go about doing that we're going to save that to the end matt any um any thoughts on this uh, on this um, yeah and i i i it's actually, it's more, I'm fascinated actually that it's stakeholder involvement is actually so high. I, I think that um, it, it shows that we need to do more about persuading other people um, of, of the benefits of, 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 a, of an automated approval system. And I think hopefully there's some, been some tips and so not necessarily about the how, but in the earlier part of the presentation about some of the, the genuine business benefits. Um, we, we, and, and I think that it is worth getting a group of like-minded people, whether you're in the contracting or the legal um, uh, uh, departments, to go through and actually come up with working out where you can improve the business and where you think you'll be able to improve the business by doing some of these things and sourcing this out, because that, that seems to me about how to then 
talk to um, uh, to actually talk to the what to the to the stakeholders about how they their, how their lives will also be improved, how their parts of the business will be improved, and therefore the business benefits um, as well. Good, and thanks for the guys who shared the other. They're interesting, very interesting yeah. readout. Okay, Matt. Is this you or me? I can't remember. Best um, practices. Um, we can let. Why don't we do it together? So, um, absolutely. From the blueprint, take an 80-20. Don't try and boil the ocean. Focus on the key things that are going to drive systemic improvement. So it is. you don't need to design a workflow that's looking at the outliers. Focus on the, the 80% of the, of the activity. Automate your high volume and low value activities. Take humans out of that process. The things con continuous, laborious, repetitive tasks humans are useless at get the machine to do it. Continual communication. The things where humans are good at focus their energy. So in innovation, in relationships, the things that are human skills, that's where you need to keep the people. Continue. And Paul, I just, just want to make one, just going back, just going back to point two automating, because it goes back to the stakeholder engagement, um, is that actually, if you can start automating some um, uh, of the high volume, volume low value contracts, then actually you can then generate the, the, the demonstrate the value, um, and I think that it is always worth starting. And I think someone made the the point in the in the chat um, about actually being able to demonstrate a quick win, and that is being able to demonstrate that this can be done, it can be more efficient, and then you can then start looking at automating potentially slightly more complex contracts as well. Indeed, absolutely, it's a good point that uh, that, that Carolyn made there. Um, communication, you can never uh, under communicate. So, so as you're going through this, like any other major change program, documentation, clearly documenting the process and getting concurrence from folks who own the process, establishing a, a rubric, a model for how all that works, but without, but maintaining it at the right level of detail. If you get lost in the weeds and are focused on outliers, then you're going to wrap yourself around a lot of, a lot of unnecessary detail which will hamper your ability to develop workflow. Um, and Matt said it already, don't, don't expect perfection out, out the box. Go for this agile approach of, of, of suck it and see. As you're gonna see, modern workflow tools are graphical. They enable you to, to, to develop a workflow and then might do minor in, in um, amendments as we go. That's the hallmark of a successful deployment. So let's keep reviewing and keep adjusting as we go through. Right, so last slide then before we be, before we hear from Tara. Success. Absolutely, and th this is a client that we worked with in the, in the um, telco sector, large company, 2,000 nearly employees, one half billion revenue. Um, but 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 it, it, the company came from mergers, lots of legacy issues, lots of legacy type contracts, different contract templates being used by different departments, uh, not necessarily even and all, lots of different contract repositories, um, and and therefore understanding what the risk level was and all of that inefficiency. And I'm sure we've all worked in organisations which have this, particularly if the company has has gone through uh, sort of mergers, acquisitions. And, and different people with different um, legacy legacy histories. Um, and again, what, 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 the, what the team decided to do was to actually take this seriously and follow effectively the, um, the, the, the steps that we outlined previously and actually look at their current processes, look at where they could actually um, template. And, but you do this, do this over a sort of six to nine month period. Don't try and do a big bang, do it all in one go, um, but actually get it up and, up and running. Um, at which point you're starting to look at the templates, you're looking at your approval workflows, um, and actually what you can automate in order to take the pressures off um, and the contractual frameworks and therefore adding things like risk compliance uh, in as well. Um, and of course, it, it, it had the benefits that, uh, that, that everybody um, hoped that it would. And, and I think that uh, you know, the lead time, lead time to contracts was, 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 was two, two days, which equate, equals 1,000 days per year. Um, and, that, and that's... And that's, but of course, that's spread over a lot of people. So that's actually, it's not necessarily all about um, saving costs and getting rid of people. What it's also about is actually allowing people to go home a little bit earlier, allowing something to get done a bit more quickly, allowing a team to to to, to move ahead um, and and actually get things done. So, um, um, but 
as well as that efficiency, also you can now report on it, at which point you can see what the trends are, you can set the benchmarks for the, for the future, and the company now has control of where it's going, um, which is just adding to that efficiency, taking a huge level of risk um, from the business in terms of understanding the contracts that it's signed up to um, and knowing where those contracts are and where it can do. And so reducing the risk as well. So you can hear, see those, those, those huge benefits by, by, by going through an organized and disciplined process over a period of time can have these huge material benefits. Um, uh, probably though, one of the things that, uh, and the reason you've all stayed to the end, um, was to actually see a little bit of a demonstration of a, of a world-class tool um, as to how actually you can build a workflow um, sort of in use, using modern, uh, 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 modern graphics. Um, and uh, we're pleased that uh, Tara um, Bennett, our, our head of um, sales engineering here at Contract Pod AI, um, is on the call um, and uh, is going to just uh, take us through um, a couple of examples. Thank you, Tara. I am. Thank you, Matt. And I'm just going to pop my camera on briefly just to say hello briefly before I switch it off again in order to share my screen and avoid you all looking at my head. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Is that coming through well? It is. We can see it just fine. Perfect. Very conscious of time. So we're just going to go through and we're just going to create a very simple workflow in terms of how we instigate the process. We come in and we just give it a name. And then what we're asked to do is to tie it to an application. So we're going to tie this to the contract lifecycle management piece and then to a specific application type. So it could be any form of, of contract type that you wish. I'm just going to pick frame as a, as a, a very as an example, we're going to save and continue. Now, what that brings us into here is into the workflow designer. Forgive me while I just adjust my screen. I just want to make sure you've all got a, a good view. And you'll notice here that we're starting with a blank canvas. Just in terms of orienting you, in terms of the functionality that's available, we can make this full screen. We can zoom in and out. Of course, as workflows become more complex, you may need to be able to zoom in to specific areas. But what we're gonna talk about now is just very briefly, we're gonna build a very quick four-step process. Now, in order to create and to start creating, we just need to think about this in terms of the stages. What steps do we need to take and what activities um, support this particular process and this particular workflow? So we're gonna start off, simple one click, we're gonna create a stage. As this is the first stage, it is the initial one. Now, when I click in here, I now have the ability to do a couple of things. First of all, I can give it a, a name. So let's think of a really simple use case. And let's say that somebody is going to submit um, a legal request. And then you'll note on here, I can assign this to a status. So when we're in a contract record within the system, we can track the workflow whereabouts we are within a contract record at, at any time. So we're going to say this is where the request has been submitted. And we're simply going to, to save that. I hope you agree that that's all fairly, fairly straightforward. We now, as we go through, have the ability to be able to add additional steps. Now, by clicking this box here, it automatically creates a second stage and gives me the ability to, to join that up. And this second stage could, for example, be a uh, negotiation stage. I noticed that somebody um, said, sorry, I've lost the ability to spell, trying to talk and type at the same time, never been my, never been my strong point. <laughs> Actually, let's do it this way. Just because when I become conscious, I can't spell it actually gets worse. So we're going, going to move to a negotiation stage. Now, of course, that might mean many different things to each of you. That could be offline processes. That could be collaborating within a tool, perhaps sending emails back and forth. But for example purposes, we're just going to call it negotiation. And then we have this, this piece in here. So what this has the ability to do is as part of that transition, how do we want to manage that? How do we want to control that? So is it 
automatically that somebody is going to submit a request and it immediately goes into into a negotiation phase? Or is it that actually we're expecting something to happen here or perhaps we want to give somebody access to be able to do something here? So we're going to be able to leverage all of the standard features and functions available in the system. So in this example, we're going to say we're going to instigate that request. And we're going to upload a version. Now, this could be in this example in any way. It could be somebody uploading it into the tool, ingesting it into the system via the Outlook plugin. It could be um, coming through Salesforce, any, any way that you that you would like, including something that has been um, happened offline. And we can state here that the, we, are, we always want to apply this condition. Now, let's be honest, in the real world with practicalities, we may want to go and add conditions. So I just want to give you a brief oversight here as to how you can break this down. So you could come along and you could say, if a request comes in, from sales or procurement or whomever it may be, and it involves a specific contracting party, we need to route it in a particular way. I think to Matt's point earlier on, if you wanted to base this workflow on something like jurisdiction, for example, you have that ability to set up all of that transition and all of that conditional logic within this part here. For now, we're not going to use this. We're just going to say always, when a version is uploaded, it's going to go through to the negotiation phase. You can move these around at any stage. Now, something else I'm going to try and talk about while I'm while I'm clicking around within here as well is the fact that within our workflow builder, we also control the features and functions that are available to people. So let's say, for example, excuse me, user error on this piece. If we wanted to delete it and start again, we can absolutely do that. We're going to click this on here. I'm having issues with my mouse today. So we could come in here and we could say um, at this particular part, this is where we want to move to. Perhaps we've done that negotiation piece and perhaps we're awaiting signature. And we can we can save that. And essentially what we have the ability to do is just to build this up as we go. My mouse is failing me right now. I apologize, it's a remote one. Let's go in and take a look at a pre-existing example. Um, but I just wanted to give you an understanding as to how we can build a workflow and how we can control the features. Likewise, within the system here, we keep a track of all of the stages and all of the steps. And this is something you might find useful. So in terms of usability, I'm getting some feedback, unfortunately. If ever you're not sure, you can directly see in here some help and some guidance. I think we mentioned earlier on about perhaps sophisticated processes and having timers involved or specific conditions. If we zoom out of this one, I'm gonna go back into the workflow designer just to show you a previously created example. So you'll see in this example, to the points that um, Matt was talking about earlier on, we have a request being submitted, a version being uploaded. And as part of that negotiation piece, we are allowing collaboration. We're locking it at certain points. And we're also seeking approval. There could be a legal approval as part of that, but equally there could be some form of approval from sales or procurement or somebody else with some kind of subject matter expertise. This version updating as part of that negotiation piece can loop around. You can go back and forth as many times as you would like. And then when we get to the awaiting signature part, we're going to invoke that electronic signature using, you know, DocuSign, Adobe Sign, whichever regional provider that you use. And then at the point that a signature is received, the document becomes active, executed. And then in this example, we actually have that once it's become active, this isn't something that we need to continually monitor. We're going to archive that. Now, of course, that process can um, be completely adaptable to your um, business requirements on a contract by contract basis, as simple or as complex as you need, leveraging 
all resources within the business, not just legal, but anybody else you need to bring in as part of this process, you absolutely have the ability to do that. I appreciate that was a very high level overview. We, we are, do you have a question? Stimulated, stimulated loads of questions. Um, so, uh, and a question for me first. So, so having done all this design, uh, does this then automatically drop through into the tool? So this workflow is then in production? Is that how it works? It, yeah, it, it absolutely does. So we configure this within the vault area of the solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the trained administrators for our clients that utilize the system, they would have access to this. Of course, we build out workflows on behalf of our clients during implementation, but equally you can take ownership of this as you move forwards. Perfect. And Stephanie asks, so I think you talked about electronic signature tools. So your doctor mm. and the, and the, um, the echo sign and those, those guys uh, yeah. integrated into any, any other tools? Yes. So, yes. <laughs> so essentially, you can take the process offline by sending an email, creating notifications. But mm -hmm. what we're leveraging within here are some of the additional features and functions within our system. So we're looking here at our collaboration tool. Um, but you need to bear in mind as well that sometimes these processes and this workflow starts from somewhere outside of the system. We have a very close-knit Salesforce integration, just one example, whereby somebody in sales could come along and you know, request a contract and they don't ever need to leave Salesforce. It can go off to various different individuals throughout the business in mm. order for them then to get back exactly what they need. Understood. So integrated through open APIs into other products. Ab absolutely correct, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a stack of questions, um, and uh, both on chat and also on the QA that we haven't got had time to get to. Where did that hour go? Whoosh. Um, just remains for me to say thank you to our audience for staying with us. Uh, great presentation. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Tara, for the, for the, uh, for the real live demo. It, it always helps to bring it to life when you can see how you'd actually do it in a system. And thanks to Contract Pod AI, our partner for the webinar today. Um, keep an eye out for the slides and for the recording. Um, and uh, just remains for me to wish you a very enjoyable rest of your day. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.